Welcome to today's Train Engineers Newsletter Live program. I'm Jeannie Harshaw, and today we'll discuss air to water heat pump system design. On today's program, we'll introduce chiller heater systems that are based on air to water heat pumps. We'll first give an update on decarbonization initiatives, including electrification of heating, and then cover strategies for reliable and effective system designs. We'll begin with a system overview, then cover related codes, followed by load and sizing considerations. And we'll also discuss system configurations and options. To cover this information today, we have train application engineers Rick Hyden, Charlie Jellin, and Dan Gentry. So Rick, can you start us off? Thanks, Jeannie. Local governments in the US and around the world are increasingly requiring building owners and manufacturers to lower their overall carbon footprints. These requirements can take many forms, ranging from carbon taxes to fossil fuel bans. Building owners can reduce their site carbon footprint by improving efficiency, using lower GWP refrigerants, and depending on the source energy, electrify heating systems. With an electric utility grid that is poised to add large quantities of renewable energy, Designers are looking towards electrification of building heating systems through application of heat pump technology. This ENL will cover chiller heater systems based on air to water heat pumps and provide guidance for evaluating loads, sizing equipment, and plant configurations. We have a lot of information to cover today, but before we start, let's review the current decarbonization landscape in the US. Within the last two years, the U.S. federal government has taken several actions aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, including re-signing the Paris Agreement and enacting several executive orders and federal rules. Collectively, these target a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas pollution by 2030, a 100% carbon pollution-free power sector by 2035, and a net zero emissions economy by 2050. Now, since 1991, over 600 local governments have developed climate action plans that include greenhouse gas reduction targets. Some cities have even gone so far as to ban the use of natural gas for heating in certain new building types. Now, these evolving initiatives are incenting nearly every U.S. utility grid towards lowering source emissions and at the same time requiring building owners to report on and in some cases pay for carbon site emissions. So you may be wondering how a building's heating and cooling system affects greenhouse gas emissions. In general, there are four things that determine a building's carbon footprint related to operating an HVAC system. First, the heating and cooling loads. Second, the system efficiency. Third, the system types, including equipment technology, fuel, and refrigerant choices. And lastly, the carbon footprint of the source energy. While it may be obvious that renewable energy investments can reduce building emissions, the impact of investing in HVAC technology may be less apparent. In this ENL, we're going to focus on how to reduce emissions by using efficient electric air to water heat pump systems to heat and cool buildings. Successfully applying this technology requires a keen understanding of the building load profiles and careful system selection and design. Now, before we get into the electrified heating system details, let's take a moment to get grounded in some of the relevant terminology. First, air to water heat pumps are units that can heat or cool fluids, and they may include a reversing valve in the refrigeration circuit. They also may include more than one refrigeration circuit. Two pipe units have one pipe for fluid supply and one pipe for fluid return. These units can heat or cool fluid but not simultaneously. Four pipe distribution systems use separate piping loops to distribute heating and cooling fluids and can do so simultaneously in the building. Now much of our discussion will involve two pipe units in the chiller heater plant along with four pipe distribution systems. In lower ambient climates, air to water heat pumps must enter defrost mode to melt ice that's built up on the air to refrigerant coil. We'll discuss how that affects plant capacity and unit sizing. And lastly, units of tons are typically used for cooling capacity, but BTU per hour is typically used for heating capacity. Note that one ton equals 12,000 BTUs per hour, which is equivalent to 12 MBH. 
Now, common language here will help us stay on the same page. So, okay, Charlie, help us understand what a chiller heater system is. Thanks, Rick. Let's start with the equipment that produces chilled and hot water. All of these units could come in either packaged equipment or modular equipment. Today's focus is going to be on air to water equipment, which can come in four different flavors. The first and the most well-known is just an air-cooled chiller. We use the ambient air as a sink to reject BTUs from the chilled water stream to create that chilled water. The second iteration on this would be to add a secondary heat exchanger to the air-cooled chiller. This would allow the unit to divert hot gas away from the condenser coil and to that secondary heat exchanger. The heat exchanger would be hooked up to a hot water system and allow the building to capture that rejected heat for simultaneous cooling and heating loads. This type of product would not incorporate a reversing valve and would only be able to provide useful heat when a cooling load is present. The third category would be air to water heat pumps that utilize a reversing valve to allow the unit to use the ambient air as both a source and a sink for BTUs, meaning it could change modes to provide either cooling or heating throughout the year. The last unit combines the air to water heat pump with a heat recovery heat exchanger. This unit would be able to act like a heat pump to provide either cooling or heating. Then it could also provide recovered heat from the cooling load if the building has simultaneous cooling and heating requirements. Now the basis of this ENL will focus in on air to water heat pumps and how to properly apply them. But we'll also show various ways to incorporate these other technologies throughout the presentation. Let's start by focusing in on the refrigeration circuit that makes a heat pump unique. The refrigeration component that enables changeover between the cooling and heating is, is a refrigerant reversing valve or a four-way valve. A reversing valve switches the flow of refrigerant through the heat exchangers depending on unit mode of operation. The refrigerant always flows through the compressor in the same direction. The reversing valve coordinates flow direction through the refrigerant to water and the air source heat exchangers in the unit. When the unit needs to provide cooling to the building, the refrigerant to water coil is the energy source for the refrigeration circuit, absorbing heat from the chilled water. The refrigerant to air coil is the energy sink by rejecting heat to the ambient air. In this mode, the unit has the exact same operation as an air-cooled chiller. To change over heating, the unit reverses the refrigerant flow through the coils and changes to the heating expansion valve. In heating mode, the refrigerant to air coil is the energy source in the circuit, absorbing heat from the outdoor air, while the refrigerant to water coil is the energy sink by rejecting heat to the hot water circuit. When the unit needs to go into defrost mode, it essentially goes into cooling mode to send hot refrigerant to the outdoor coil to melt the frost. Next, we want to talk about the systems these air to water heat pumps will be applied in. For today's discussion, we'll be focusing in on a dual feed production system with four pipe distribution. While other system configurations are possible and will not be unusual, this one provides excellent flexibility and simplicity of design and control. First, we'll look at the distribution loops. Four pipe distribution allows for heating and cooling of the building zones simultaneously, meaning any zone has the ability to receive chilled water or hot water as needed throughout the year. Typically, these loops would be pumped using variable flow. Both distribution loops are shown as decoupled from the production loop. This allows for greater flexibility during design as well as eventual operation. Notably, these decoupled systems support any distribution flow or delta T, no matter the flow range of the heat pumps. Additionally, variable size and types of production units can be applied to best meet the building load requirements. Moving into the production loops, we see the air to water heat pumps. These units are piped in a dual feed and return piping arrangement. This allows each unit to provide either heating or cooling, irrespective of any other unit's mode of operation. We also show variable production pumping to simplify and positively meet the unit's flow requirements as efficiently as possible. Before we move into the system design and unit sizing, Dan is going to walk us through a few code and standard updates that apply to air-to-water heat pumps. 
As Charlie described early on, our industry is embarking on this new direction to electrify our heating systems in an effort to help decarbonize our environment. There are many levers that governments or businesses can use to help move this process forward. If a designer wants to evaluate multiple equipment solutions, it is desirable to have a common standard or rating system for a type of equipment and how it is applied. When local officials adopt or update their energy codes or requirements, it is also appropriate to have a common reference in language that can be adopted and enforced. Let's take a look at how the latest efficiency codes affect air to water heat pumps. For simplicity, and because it's adopted directly or by reference by most U.S. states, we'll concentrate on ASHRAE 90.1 2019 for code-related considerations and how they are applied to air-to-water heat pumps. Your particular jurisdiction may have adopted, modified, or eliminated these requirements. As always, we advise checking with your local code official or energycodes.gov to find out which requirements apply to your building. Beginning in the 2019 version of ASHRAE 90.1, a new class of equipment was included, heat pump and heat recovery chiller packages. Minimum efficiency requirements are now established and are defined for air to water heat pumps. Let's take a further look at some of the aspects of these requirements. First, we see that equipment sizes are grouped into two buckets, less than 150 tons and 150 tons and higher. Next is likely familiar to us chiller folks, and that is definitions for two possible ways to meeting cooling efficiency requirements, defined by path A and a path B, of which one path must be met if the heat pump will be used in cooling mode. Recall that heat pumps operating in cooling mode are less efficient compared to chillers, so the cooling requirements for heat pumps are lower than that of chillers. Note that if the heat pump will only be used as a heating only unit, it does not have to comply with either cooling efficiency path. On to the new stuff. Now we have the addition of heating mode requirements. For air to water heat pumps, the standard has defined two rating points for ambient temperature. Think of this as a mild mode and a cold mode. In order to comply with the standard, the piece of equipment being evaluated must meet the listed performance at both mild and cold heating ambient rating temperatures. With standard rating ambient temperatures defined, we now have to look at heating water temperatures. The standard has grouped these into low, medium, and high liquid temperatures. The table then defines what the minimum required COP needs to be based on the rated ambient and water temperature in order to comply. The last item to cover here is the test procedure. Similar to cooling chillers, AHRI 550-590 defines the procedure for verifying unit performance via testing. With unit minimum performance requirements understood, we can review the system code requirements and how they are applicable to chiller heater systems utilizing air-to-water heat pumps. Two common system types seen today are two-pipe and four-pipe. As the name implies, a two-pipe distribution system has one set of supply and return pipes. The system can also be referred to as a two-pipe changeover system. With this type of piping distribution, the system will be in either heating or cooling mode. When the heat pump and the system change from one mode to the other, this is called changeover. Because there can be some significant energy implications associated with this changing of modes, 90.1 has several requirements aimed at minimizing excessive energy consumption in these types of systems. First, the system controls must include a dead band between heating and cooling of at least 15 degrees outdoor air temperature. This is intended to limit the system from switching back and forth between modes too often, which can be very energy intensive. Second is that the system controls require at least four hours of operation in one mode before changing to the other. This is another limit on preventing the system from switching modes too frequently, thereby cooling or heating fluids that were previously heated or cooled. The last requirement is that the system controls reset the heating and cooling supply temperatures so that they are no further than 30 degrees apart at changeover. This limits the pull-down loads and associated energy consumption after the system is changed over. So what about four-pipe systems? As the name implies, the system consists of supply and return pipes 
for each of the heating and cooling loops, or four pipes. At the time of this recording, there are currently no specific system requirements for four pipe distribution systems defined by 90.1. However, there are a few system items we will consider. The section pertaining to pump flow control essentially requires variable frequency driven pump performance once the system has three or more control valves and once the collective pump horsepower rises above a threshold based on climate zone and whether the pump is used for heating or cooling. In a chiller heater system that uses the same pumps for cooling and heating, the more constraining threshold governs. For this reason, and for better control in all modes of operation, pumps are equipped with variable frequency drives in all standard configurations. Note this does not necessarily mean variable primary flow, so decoupled pumping is still acceptable. Chilled and hot water reset are addressed, which requires automatic resetting of the fluid temperature set points once the system gets larger than 25 tons. Three common ways to accomplish this could be return water reset, auto air temperature reset, and valve position. There are a few exceptions for district energy and process applications where applicable. Though this section describes the requirements for a gas boiler in a system, it could still apply to a heat pump system that has a boiler in it. The exemptions list for this section references heat recovery chillers, boilers in individual spaces, and perimeter convective heat, all of which may be applicable to our four pipe system. Another applicable section here defines that coils and heat exchangers must be selected to develop 120 degrees or less return water temperature to the boiler. To summarize codes and standards, heat pumps and heat recovery are new additions to 90.1 beginning with the 2019 version. Two pipe systems have several energy conserving measures to consider and four pipe systems have no special requirements. Be sure to understand the system type and exemptions and always check your local codes. In this next section, we want to start looking at how to properly size air to water heat pumps. We're going to start by analyzing different building load profiles in different ambient locations. First, we'll look at one specific load profile for a K-12 school in climate zone 4A. The buildings represented are the ASHRAE building models used as a basis for standard 90.1 2019. Hourly load data was extracted from Trace 3D Plus, which uses the Energy Plus calculation engine. Each point on the plot represents an hourly load point as a function of outdoor air temperature over a typical calendar year. The cloud of points in the blue and to the right represents cooling load, and in red to the left are heating loads. A couple interesting trends to call out. The higher grouping to the left is occupied heating loads, and the lower grouping to the left is unoccupied heating loads. The difference is driven by the increased requirement for ventilation air during those occupied times. It is well understood that 100% cooling capacity is not often needed. This is even more true for heating. Notice the point density near the peak hours, the green circles. Hours near peak load are very few for cooling, but even fewer for heating. Now let's bring in different building types with different ventilation rates and climate zones and then compare. We'll look at an office building in climate zone 4B, an outpatient building in climate zone 5A, and the school from our first example. First, notice the variation in the difference between the cooling and heating peaks on the plots. The magnitude of the differences varies primarily by ventilation rate. There will be some variation driven by the building type and the climate zone, but it is important to note that the ventilation rate impacts loads much more than building type and climate zone. Another observation from the charts is that the commercial buildings with primarily comfort heating and cooling have a limited simultaneous heating and cooling demand during prime economizing times. This reduces the energy benefit of waterside heat recovery. However, there are other benefits to properly sized heat recovery that we're going to discuss later. Now let's start to translate these load profiles into equipment sizing. The air to water heat pump system needs to be sized to handle both the cooling and the heating peak loads. The same piece of equipment is expected to satisfy both. 
Not only is the magnitude of the peaks different, but the capacity of the equipment varies with the outdoor air temperature. The air to water heat pump heating capacity at the design heating ambient temperature is typically much less than the unit nominal cooling capacity. This may result in substantially different equipment selections for design cooling and heating. Because of the dramatic change in air to water heat pump heating capacity at low outdoor air temperatures, a careful analysis of unit capacity, sizing, and selection is required. A commonly used AHRI rating point for heating capacity is at 47 degree outdoor air temperature. However, the outdoor air design heating temperature is typically much colder, resulting in a substantial capacity adjustment. This figure shows the relationship between available heat pump capacity as a function of outdoor air temperature, normalized to the 47 degree AHRI rating point. At zero degrees, you can expect to see about a 40 to 50% reduction from rated capacity. Also worth noting here is that the selected heating water supply temperature impacts capacity as well, but in a much more limited way. Knowing the heating and cooling D rate based on design conditions will allow us to properly size our plant. We'll use the K-12 school example in Climate Zone 4A for this specific example. The blue line is showing peak cooling load versus ambient temperature, and the red line is showing peak heating load versus ambient temperature. This example needs about 215 cooling tons at peak, with the heating peak requiring about 2 million BTUs. If we size this plant for cooling and ran the air to water heat pumps at the AHRI rating condition of 47 degrees, it would appear that we have more than enough capacity to meet the heating peak. However, that nominal rating point means very little in regards to this specific project. For this example, we need to find the performance of the heat pump at 4 degrees. Re-rating the heat pump at the project design conditions shows us we'd run out of heating capacity around 15 degrees. To properly size heat pumps for this plant, we need to use the heating peak as our starting point. For our example, sizing based on heating peak would require around 330 tons of cooling capacity, which is over 50% more capacity than what is required on the cooling side. The next topic we need to discuss for unit sizing is defrost. Dan's going to walk us through the basics. Now let's take a look at defrost implications and considerations. Low outdoor air temperatures can cause the outdoor coil temperature to drop below freezing, potentially resulting in frost accumulation on the coil. Defrost typically only occurs below 47 degrees outdoor air temperature. Air to water heat pump units will automatically enter defrost operation when it's required. Many air to water heat pump unit controls have intelligent defrost control to minimize defrost while maximizing unit heating efficiency and capacity. Most controls also limit defrost to one circuit or module at a time to help minimize the temperature impact on the system. So what can be done to address the impact of defrost? We discussed several items and unit design considerations on this topic in our recent ENL on DCARB, but they are worth reviewing here as well. Let's review this list. The first is unit sizing based on a defrost D-rate factor. Defrost operation results in a weighted performance D-rate to the equipment heating capacity delivered. Some judgment is involved by the designer because the frequency and therefore impact of defrost operation is dependent on actual operating conditions. In an effort to simplify the impact of defrost on unit sizing, we have developed a D-rate factor. The table shown here offers suggested heating capacity D-rate ranges based on operating outdoor air temperature. As Charlie will discuss in the unit sizing exercise, the D-rate factor should be applied to the required unit design capacity and selections to be made based on this. The equipment schedules and schedule notes should clarify this has been done. This will help ensure equipment selections include the proper defrost impact. Second is the number of units or circuits. A designer could specify extra modules, extra units, or select units with more circuits or compressors to address defrost. With more circuits in the system, the impact of defrost could be minimized. Third is the timing and volume. Some heat pumps have timers that limit defrost mode duration 
which can be used to estimate the transient impact on heating capacity. Adding system volume to counter this is a good system choice. With more loop time, defrost will have a lower impact on the distribution systems, smoothing out system operation and temperature delivery. Rick will cover this in more detail shortly. Lastly, auxiliary heating sources such as boilers can be used to satisfy the heating load or supplement plant heating capacity in situations where the heat pump heating capacity is limited. Auxiliary heating sources can be sequenced into the system at the break-even carbon emissions point, which Charlie will discuss. Now that we understand how air-to-water heat pump equipment will respond to both outdoor air temperature and defrost, we can start to size our plant. For our K-12 school, the sum of peak loads is 2600 MBH, and the block load is 2000 MBH. The equipment list shown here provides four different nominal heat pump sizes, along with the heating output at minimum ambient. If size based on sum of peaks, we'd end up oversizing the plant by at least 34% from the design. On the low end, if we used two 160-ton nominal heat pumps, we'd end up with at least 6% short of the design condition. The first pair of heat pumps that can meet the design condition are rated at 180 tons. However, these values do not account for defrost. Using the D-rate table that Dan just showed, we need to account for about 15% of the design capacity. In order for us to safely meet our heating design condition, and account for defrost, we'd recommend using two 200-ton nominal heat pumps for this project. Here is what sizing the heat pump plant with two 200-ton heat pumps would look like across the entire year. The dashed lines are the expected peak loads for the ambient temperature, and the solid lines are the average plant load for the ambient conditions. Between 40 and 70 degrees, we assume one heat pump is dedicated to heating mode and the other is dedicated to cooling mode. Shown here is heating mode with the capacity D rate as the ambient temperature decreases. Below 40F, both units are in heating mode. Including the defrost D rate, we can see we still have adequate capacity to meet the design heating peak. Next, we're showing the cooling capacity between 40 and 70 degrees. Notice this time the capacity D rate is opposite the heating capacity D rate because we lose cooling capacity as the ambient increases. Above 70 degrees, both units are dedicated to cooling and have more than enough capacity to meet the building loads. Across the board, you can see there is no lack of capacity to meet the building loads and the heat pumps will be lightly loaded for much of the year. To that point, let's take a look at the actual run hours for these two units. This chart is showing you percent of total run hours in ambient buckets throughout the year. The first bucket is showing you the coldest ambient conditions for the year and requires two heat pumps in heating mode. This bucket only has 5% of the total operating hours and shows you just how little peak heating is happening throughout the year. The next bucket is one heat pump in heating mode and comes in with the highest weighting of 46% of the run hours. One heat pump in cooling contributes a third of the run hours, and two heat pumps in cooling mode has 13% of the run hours. The last bucket is the potential heat recovery operation. At only 3% of the total run hours, this bucket has the lowest usage. Without some kind of process load like a data closet, the simultaneous operating hours for this application are extremely low. Having units capable of heat recovery would provide very little in terms of financial payback for a project like this. The example we just showed is for Climate Zone 4A, and this is just one example. Heat pump plant sizing will depend on location and building type. We modeled the ASHRAE 90.1 basis buildings in the climate zones shown here. Displayed is what we found to drive the size of the heat pump plant by building type and climate zone. In cooling dominated climates and for buildings with lower ventilation requirements, cooling will size the plant. In heating dominated climates with higher ventilation requirements, heating will size the plant. And shaded in purple are the buildings that fall in between and can go either way as the design day requirements are closely matched. 
For the next section, we want to transition over to the design hot water set point used for these systems. The temperature the design team chooses to use will not impact the building required capacity. What will be impacted is the operating COP or the efficiency of the heat pump and its capacity. This graph is showing minimum efficiency requirements for air to water heat pumps in heating mode at standard AHRI heating conditions. There are three different supply hot water temperatures, 105, 120, and 140, at two different ambient conditions, 47 and 17 degrees. We've connected the points with a linear slope to show the general trend. The first thing that pops out is that the COP drops as the ambient temperature decreases regardless of supply hot water temperature. This seems rather intuitive. The second thing to note is the increased efficiency requirement for lower hot water temperatures. Unit efficiency increases dramatically as the hot water set point decreases and we can more easily achieve higher efficiencies. Let's analyze that 17 degree ambient point. Moving from 140 degree hot water set point to 120 degree hot water increases unit efficiency by 20%. Moving from 140 to 105 increases unit efficiency by 37%. An easy rule of thumb is that you'll take a 1% efficiency penalty for every increased degree of hot water set point above 105 degrees. After viewing that last slide, you might be thinking, the lower the hot water temperature, the better, which for efficiency is generally true, but there is a limit. We need to look at the terminal equipment to make sure we can adequately heat the space with the hot water temperature that we deliver. This table shows typical hot water requirements for different equipment and system types. These temperatures will likely surprise many people. They are much lower than common design conditions we typically see. But any coil selection program will be able to confirm that these temperatures are achievable today. And the one and only John Murphy is going to dive deeper on this specific topic on a future EN, so keep an eye out for that. Before we move into the next section, I want to zoom out for a second. Most designers are pursuing electrification as a way to reduce carbon emissions. To understand the impact electrification will have on a specific building, we first need to understand the emission rate for the utility that we're sourcing electricity from. This map is showing you the emission rate for utility grids across the country. The darker the color, the higher the emission rate. Electrification will have a bigger impact on overall emission reductions as grid emission factors are reduced. Let's look at a quick example. If we designed an all electric heating plant with a 140 degree hot water set point, where the average annual heating COP was two, our break even emission factor would be around 800 pounds of CO2E per megawatt hour of consumption. Meaning if this building was located on one of the utility grids shaded in green, the heat pump heating system would reduce the overall carbon emissions. Alternatively, if we took the same design but lowered the hot water set point to 105 degrees, our break-even carbon emission factor would be around 1,100 pounds of CO2e per megawatt hour. You can see that the increased efficiency would further reduce carbon emissions and add more utility grids to the map. Designing for lower hot water set points can provide increased energy efficiency lower emissions, and provide the design team with more heat pump equipment options. Another consideration is the forecast for each of these utility grids. Even if you're currently operating on a grid with a high emission factor, the future plans for that grid likely includes large quantities of renewable energy, which can drastically decrease the overall emission factor. As Charlie introduced earlier, four pipe distribution, dual feed, is the base configuration recommended for use with multiple air to water heat pumps. Note that this system applies to packaged or modular units. While other system configurations are possible and will not be unusual, this one provides excellent flexibility and simplicity of design and control. Let's dig into this system. We know this system is a primary secondary configuration, but how does the plant work? First, let's talk about the fluid. The system example circulates the same fluid throughout the production circuit and heating and cooling distribution loops. 
Often an antifreeze solution will be desired in the outdoor production circuit so that solution will circulate throughout the distribution loops. This is the simplest and safest application since it does not rely on any powered or mechanical freeze protection strategies. Fluid isolation heat exchangers can be properly applied between the production and either or both distribution loops if the design calls for differing fluids in the distribution loops. The designer must take into consideration that below freezing temperature may enter a heat exchanger from the production loop during system changeover or a defrost cycle and take the appropriate design precautions. We have established the four pipe distribution system featuring separate heating and cooling loops. These are standard distribution loops and may be optimized for the supply temperatures, flows, and delta T's as required by the airside design. The airside coil capacity may be controlled with two-way valves causing widely variable distribution pumping flow for both the chilled water and heating water distribution. This provides for significant operational flexibility and opportunities for pumping energy savings. At the heart of the system are the decoupler lines. They provide the hydronic isolation that allows for optimization of flows and temperatures in both the distribution and production loops. Speaking of changing modes, let's look at the parts and pieces that make this work. The first parts are the isolation valves at the exiting, cooling, and heating lines of each unit. These valves could be tied to the unit controllers to stroke open or closed based on the unit mode of operation. The coordination of these valves with the unit mode of operation is imperative to system operation to ensure that the unit is providing the correct condition fluid to the correct loop. In order to maintain unit stability and operate within the required compressor map, we have incorporated a heat pump bypass or tempering valve. This valve is used when the unit switches from one mode to the other and would modulate until the supply water temperature has come to within the desired range. Last pieces are our primary or production pumps. Typically each unit would have its own dedicated pump. These pumps can be constant or variable speed. For simplicity and due to the often lack of unit turndown, pumps are typically selected with VFDs and balance to the specific heating and cooling design flow rates. Note that cooling and heating design flow rates are usually not the same, so drives are used to maintain high efficiency pumping. There are several options for the chiller heater system. Depending on the specific building requirements, there are options to increase efficiency, increase accuracy of control, and or improve redundancy. Let's take a look at what some of those options could be. This example shows how configurable the system can be. Recall our earlier example of an office building with a low ventilation rate that has a much larger cooling load than heating load. Instead of sizing the heat pumps to satisfy the cooling load, why not incorporate some chillers into the cooling production side? Air-cooled chillers utilizing scroll, screw, or centrifugal compressor technologies can be easily incorporated to the system. Chillers would also be less upfront cost and more efficient to operate, so overall savings can be increased. This layout also illustrates the versatility of the system. Notice the smaller sized heat pump for the relatively small heating load required, combined with significantly more cooling capacity with heat pumps and chillers. Finally, we need to talk about backup heat. Most air-to-water heat pump technology is limited to about zero degree ambient. For weather zones where the normal outdoor air temperature drops below zero, auxiliary heat, for example a boiler, needs to be sized to handle the design load. For climate zones 4 and some cities in climate zones 3A, emergency backup heat is needed to enable heating during the 20 or 50 year expected extreme. Emergency heat does not need to be sized for design load, but should be sized to protect the building. Design choices for heating redundancy include auxiliary boilers or N plus one heat pumps. Electric or natural gas boilers represent a reliable, low first cost option. If they only run occasionally for failure recovery or heat pump unit maintenance, 
their potential impact on the building's carbon footprint may be minimal. As shown here, when auxiliary heat is applied in the hydronic system, it is best connected into the heating distribution loop supply line. This position has the advantages of allowing the auxiliary heat to supplement the heat pump capacity when required or provide standalone heating when the heat pump production plant is shut down. The auxiliary heat source can take practically any form, from low-cost conventional natural gas boilers to electric heat. Let's examine simultaneous heating and cooling. We'll go back to our New York City school example with two 200-ton heat pumps that Charlie introduced. Dividing the system capacity between two or more units provides multiple benefits. First, it provides system turndown capability, which is especially beneficial to the many operating hours at lower loads. Second, it provides adequate capacity to meet simultaneous heating and cooling loads and efficiently addresses them without the complexity of heat recovery. But what if we can take advantage of heat recovery? Maybe my building has a data closet or requires a lot of ventilation air. Recall our table showing that simultaneous heating and cooling loads between 55 and 60 degree outdoor air are only 3% of the annual run hours. Air to water heat pumps perform at a high efficiency in this mild temperature range which means that a dedicated heat recovery chiller may have a relatively small efficiency benefit. However, a properly sized dedicated heat recovery chiller can eliminate the need to operate two air-to-water heat pump units and their associated pumps, with both units at low loads to meet the simultaneous demands. This can extend the life of the air-to-water heat pump units as well as provide some system control and efficiency benefit. Note that the size of the heat recovery chiller to provide this benefit is quite small, approximately 18 tons in this school example. Wow, Dan, this is a relatively small heat recovery opportunity. I always assumed there would be more simultaneous load. I guess this is really worth looking into then, right? Indeed. A dedicated heat recovery chiller is simple to apply between the two distribution loop return pipes. Keep in mind that a heat recovery unit can only move energy from one distribution stream to the other. Proper sizing of the heat recovery chiller is critical to the cost-effective design and selection of the system. The amount of energy that can be transferred between the loops is limited to the lower of the two loops loads at any moment in time. With a properly sized heat recovery chiller, we have the opportunity to downsize the expensive air-to-water heat pump plant and right-size the equipment for its intended use. The end result is a more cost-effective electrified solution that still meets the needs of the customer. Applying dedicated heat recovery chillers can reduce the time when multiple air-to-water heat pump units need to operate for simultaneous cooling and heating. The table shown here, which refers back to our school example, shows heat pump operating hours are reduced by up to a total of 1,600 hours per year. By recovering energy from one loop to the other, the heat recovery chiller can fully meet one required load and partially meet the other. A single air-to-water heat pump unit meets the remainder of the dominant loop's load. This can help stabilize operation and extend the heat pump unit's operating life. Heat recovery is almost always worth evaluating when a reasonable simultaneous load is available. It can be utilized to reduce energy use, lower the life cycle cost of the system, extend equipment life, increased system reliability, and may even be required by code. To summarize our four-pipe system utilizing two-pipe air-to-water heat pumps, recall that this is a very flexible and versatile system. Four-pipe systems provide a high level of control for cooling, heating, and simultaneous demands. The system can apply to several different unit types, and additional enhancements and system options can be easily integrated into the base system. Thanks, Dan. Building on what Dan mentioned earlier about loop volume, to ensure occupants remain comfortable during transients, special considerations are needed in the cooling and heating hydronic design. The guidance for cooling loop fluid volume remains at a minimum of two minutes. The heating loop is subject to additional transients such as defrost that can send cold fluid through the air handlers, quickly affecting occupant comfort. To ensure proper hot water supply, and based on our experience in the EU to date, 
the heating loop fluid volume should be about 8 gallons per heating ton. This calculation should be made using the rating heating capacity of the largest unit in the system at the AHRI conditions of 120 degree Fahrenheit leaving hot water temperature and 47 degree Fahrenheit outdoor air temperature. Using the example system Dan shared earlier, we see that the heating loop volume is substantially larger than the cooling loop. Volume tanks can be used in the production plant to partially meet this need as shown in the previous configurations. The base system that Charlie and Dan introduced is reliable and will serve many applications well. However, specific building load profiles may be better served by other chiller heater configurations, like the dedicated air-cooled chiller system that Dan described earlier. McCracken introduced a new thermal energy storage system in the July 2020 issue of the ASHRAE Journal that can take advantage of the non-coincident heating and cooling loads. The new storage source heat pump system can balance building loads and enable the capture and storage of yesterday's waste energy for tomorrow's heating. In this chiller heater system, heating loads are served by a water-to-water -water heat pump that can source energy from the building, the air, or from the energy storage tanks. In turn, the energy storage tanks can collect energy from the ambient air using the air-to-water heat pump, they can reclaim energy from the building, and can dispatch energy when they are used as a source for the chiller heater. This time-independent energy transfer can reduce air-to-water heat pump size by up to 50% and reduce the building carbon footprint. Energy storage tanks can also extend the electrified heating operating range in cold climates by enabling air-to-water heat pumps to only need to run during warmer hours of the day. And depending on the configuration and operating modes, the system can reduce both peak cooling and heating demand charges. Related system design strategies and tools will be discussed in a future ENL. Now for applications with smaller loads and significant simultaneous heating and cooling hours, multi-pipe heat recovery units can reduce plant footprint and simplify system controls. Unit-based control modes include cooling only, heating only, and simultaneous heating and cooling and do not require added system valve control. And with a higher number of relatively smaller refrigerant circuits, the impact of defrost cycles is less than package chillers. Again, related system design strategies and tools will be discussed in a future ENL. Now, as Charlie mentioned earlier, in some applications, terminal units still require 180 degree Fahrenheit water, even after transitioning to heat pump technology and typical air-to-water heat pumps are limited to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. In these cases, water-to-water -water units can be used to boost the supply water temperature to the terminal units. System controls need to ensure the source and supply loads are balanced or fighting will occur. So to summarize the chiller heater system configurations we discussed, the dual feed decoupled four pipe distribution system is quite flexible and reliable. However, some applications may be better served by an alternate configuration. Reasons for selecting one of the alternate configurations are shown, but note that the higher order systems will require more complicated controls and system costs are likely to increase as well. Although we're not covering controls in this ENL, their importance to system reliability can't go without saying. The basic chiller heater system operating modes include cooling, heating, and simultaneous heating and cooling. And in a future ENL focused on chiller heater system control, we'll provide plant operational strategies for the systems discussed today, as well as provide detailed operating modes and sequences. We focused on electrified heating systems based on air to water heat pumps in this ENL, but heating systems can be configured with VRF, unitary, and water source equipment as well. Deciding on what system is right for a given building application generally considers first cost, performance and operating cost, as well as carbon footprint. While component performance comparisons can be telling, an 8760-hour building analysis is most revealing and should be used to compare alternatives. Simulation software capability continues to evolve to support electrified heating system analysis and will also be covered in a future ENL. This ENL covered air-to-water heat pump-based systems and provided guidance for evaluating loads, sizing equipment, and configuring plant layouts. In summary, key elements to successful low-carbon applications include 
monitoring carbon regulations affecting your site, and understand applicable codes and standards. Know your building loads and leverage coincident, non-coincident, or dominant loads in system design. Size and select units and system configurations wisely considering system performance, reliability, and footprint. And consider equipment characteristics including ambient limitations and expected defrost periods. And also use lower water temperatures for heating and reduce energy and emissions. And lastly, control the plant to maintain low emissions with sequences that incorporate the carbon emissions break-even point. We hope that we provided you with enough useful guidance to help you meet your customers' needs as they electrify their heating systems. So that is our overview of air-to-water heat pump system design. Thanks to the team for putting this together. As Rick mentioned, we hope you found this information useful. And stay tuned for more information on upcoming programs around the electrification topic. Your local train account manager is a great contact for more information on where to find additional related content or information on train systems, equipment, controls, and services. Remember to download the available accompanying resources and visit Train Education Center for previous programs. As always, fill out a survey to let us know what you thought of today's program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.